Coming up on iOS Today, I get to sit back and uh, join the audience because we are talking about apps that can make your shortcuts experience all the better and all the more powerful. Stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of iOS Today is brought to you by Sennheiser. Why settle for anything less than great sound? Come hear the difference with Sennheiser. Right now for our first 100 listeners who go to Sennheiser.com slash podcast and use the promo code iOS, you'll receive 15% off the Momentum True Wireless 2 earbuds or any of their amazing headphones. Hey, folks, we're going to get to the show super quick, but I did want to mention if you have questions or maybe a family member who has questions that you'd like to have answered on this show, we really do try to go in depth with our questions and answers for the show. So send those to iOS today at twit.tv. All right, here we go. Wow. Hello and welcome to iOS Today. This is the show where we talk all things iOS, tvOS, watchOS, iPadOS, HomePodOS, all the OSs that Apple has on offer. Uh, we are here to discuss them today. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I am the other host, Rosemary Orchard. Not to be confused with Micah Sargent. <laughs> hello, Rosemary. <laughs> How are you today? Uh, I'm good. Uh, just as a warning, if anybody hears me lisping a little bit, I'm fine. I just got braces. So uh, I'm learning to speak again. It's been a week, so I'm pretty much there. But every so often I get my my tongue stuck on an S or something. <laughs> ah, are they invisible? <laughs> yeah, they are. Oh, nice. Well, good for you. Um, all right. Well, today we are going to be talking about uh, something that we had promised to talk about for a while. Um, we had mentioned that shortcuts on its own is a very powerful tool, uh, but sometimes you run into things where, hey, I want to do this or I want to do that, or I, I try doing this and I just can't do it with what shortcuts offers. And so there are some third-party apps out there that developers have made that work with shortcuts to make it even more powerful. So I recommend that you, uh, if you have not yet, go check out our episode that's all about shortcuts kind of in the basics uh, before you you check out this episode where we go into even more depth. Um, I am going to be playing the part of the audience in, in some ways here today as Rosemary talks about these these different apps and uh, ask some questions about how you know you might use these, uh, what makes this uh, helpful in in creating your shortcuts, et cetera, et cetera. I am equally as excited as I'm sure many of you audience members are to hear Rosemary uh, wax, I don't know, astounded uh, as as we go through these apps. So uh, Rosemary, why don't you kick it off with one that I actually do know about and do use uh, rather regularly? It's Toolbox Pro. Yeah, I'm just going to switch straight into Toolbox Pro as you've already introduced it. And okay, that's an interesting bug on my screen. Uh, this is fun. Uh, so you can see a uh, Discord there in the background. That's fine. That's because I'm in the chat, uh, making sure that I can see all the questions that people have got. Um, and one of the apps that I want to talk about is Toolbox Pro, as Micah said. Um, and there are a lot of actions that you just don't have in shortcuts, which Toolbox Pro allows you to do. So for example, get audio output device allows you to find out what the audio output device actually is right now at this very second. Because uh, sometimes you say, well, say, hey, so if I'm currently playing to my AirPods, I actually want to hand off to a HomePod. But if I'm currently playing to a HomePod, then I want to hand off um, you know, to my AirPods. Um, and so you need to know which device it is to do that. Otherwise, you need two different shortcuts and things like that. So there, there's a lot of things that you can't necessarily do, like is audio playing? There's no way to do that. And then there are some actions in here which actually do exist inside of Shortcuts. So for example, create a music playlist. Um, and this has more functionality in it than the standard create playlist action inside of Shortcuts. So if I just search here for create playlist, 
this is a, a good way to find an action when you know what the action is called in shortcuts. Um, and this is now showing me, of course, just the two that I want. So I've got create playlist, which creates a playlist from any items passed as input. So you have to search for your songs first and then create music playlist um, allows you to do, you know, a little bit more and you don't have to pass songs to it as input to create it. You can just create an empty one. Um, and But then you can go ahead and add lots of different items here, um, which of course, is more powerful. Um, so, Michael, what are you actually using Toolbox Pro for? Um, oh, I know what I use it for. Uh, I, I completely forgot. I use it for the shortcuts on its own does not have the ability to check if you've got a VPN running. And so I use Toolbox Pro because it does have that feature. So when I want to um, make sure that I have a VPN running um, for launching whatever app, so it, it's it's especially if I'm going to use DuckDuckGo to do a search. I want to, it's kind of like doubling down on, on privacy and security as much as I possibly can. I have a little button that I press and what it does is it checks using Toolbox Pro if there's a VPN running and it's an if then statement. So if a VPN is running, then go ahead and launch DuckDuckGo. If the VPN is not running, uh, then launch uh, my ExpressVPN uh, app, and then I can turn on the VPN before I then go to whatever it is that I want to go to. So uh, it's just checking for uh, VPN running. And I should also mention that uh, ExpressVPN has been a sponsor on the network before, but uh, regardless of that, I would use ExpressVPN because it's fantastic. But uh, yeah, that's why I'm using Toolbox Pro. So it's quite literally for that one thing, but Toolbox Pro is the one that does it. And I'm just amazed. Uh, one of my favorite things is going into, and maybe you can show uh, the listeners, going into the... Um, examples page and just all of the different things that they show you, you can do with it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, inside of Toolbox Pro, so obviously this is on my iPad. It's similar on the iPhone, but the second tab along um, is examples. Now, Toolbox Pro, Pro is free, but there is an in-app purchase, uh, one-time purchase of five, uh, $5.99 to unlock everything. But if you want to see all the things that you can do for free, um, then you can just tap into the free section and it gives you a whole bunch of examples, including you know creating an RSS reader and shortcuts if you want to do that. But there's categories. Like this is how many there are. So if you're completely new to this and you think, oh, I don't know, it's it sounds complicated. How do I use this? Tap into the tutorials option because it will give you some examples like how can you make an emoji menu? Um, and then you can tap on the download and it'll bounce you over to shortcuts. And people who are uh, eagle-eyed may have noticed I'm using iOS 14 here um, so instead of my iOS 15 uh, iPad. Um, and uh, there we go, back into all my shortcuts. Now I've got my emoji menu sample. And for some reason, it's saying uh, it, I need a higher version of uh, shortcuts for this. So I'll have to leave that one for now. I think some of these, I am on the beta, so I'm, this may have actually already updated for iOS 15. Um, but let's do the check silent mode example. So it, it shows you all the used tools. These are Toolbox Pro tools. Um, so I'll just download that one uh, and you go through. And I've got that same problem there with that action, but that's okay. Um, I can fix this off the top of my head without needing to worry. It's a simpler one. So let's go in here. Uh, and I need to give this access to Toolbox Pro to make sure that it's allowed to run. Um, and uh, we are just going to search for silent. Uh, and it should come up with that action and it's not doing that right now, but there would be a silent action at the top. Uh, it's very unfortunate that I have managed to break my shortcuts installation by not running iOS 15 today because I wanted to be on a more stable release. Um, but yes, this one is, is good. So basically it would get silent mode. If silent mode is true, uh, I'm not quite sure why this is showing up as this weird little blob. Um, I have a feeling that some shortcut stuff is a little bit broken in general because of the betas uh, in general. Um, but um, yeah, so um, check silent mode. If it is silent, then it it, it buzzes. Otherwise, it plays an, uh, an alarm sound. And these sounds are built into Toolbox Pro. Um, now, what I should note is by default, whenever you add a Toolbox Pro action, if you tap on this little show more, it has show when run. And if you want just a smoother experience with none of these things popping up at the top, uh, then you can toggle off show when run. Um, and it means, um, and I am just going to delete a couple of actions here um, so that I can show you uh, keep actions. There we go. So I'm going to keep the play sound. Um, and then you'll see it's running. 
Uh, and that that's playing an alarm sound quite loudly in my ears, <laughs> but you didn't see it pop up. And if I toggle this back on um, and then run it, then you'll see that it comes up with a little pop up at the top. And now I have to tap done before it can continue. And then it does that very loud chirping sound in my ear. This is a brilliant sound, by the way, if you do want something that's going to, you know, really grab your attention. So have, have a play around, especially if you want to be able to do uh, things like uh, new mail and things like that, because I actually use this. Uh, so whenever my um, stuff comes through my letterbox, I have a, a device running pushcut. We're not going to go into pushcut today because it's very you know, there's a lot that we could go into there. We could probably do three episodes on on the app and we don't have time for that in today's episode. But I have an iPhone that just runs shortcuts all the time. And whenever I get mail, it runs a shortcut on that iPhone um, and then it plays this new mail sound for me, uh, which is actually really great. Uh, one of the things with... with um that you just brought now I'm now I'm blanking quite literally uh you had mentioned that uh there was something in toolbox pro that I thought was cool and now I'm just completely blanking on it um you were talking oh uh, this is this is an aside um I love that uh I have a, a shortcut don't show this yet this has addresses folks that's why I'm um being cagey here um Okay. Yes, that's one of the things whenever you, you've got a shortcut um, you, and you've got personal information in it. And I will show you actually um, in a, a, a later section how you can make sure that that's hidden whenever you're sharing it with other people. But of course, if people are seeing your screen, like we're going to see Micah's screen here, then that information is still there for everybody to read. And we don't want whoever's address this is that might have been in the shortcut. All right. So here we go. Um, my, so back uh, before my partner and I had lived together, uh, I would often go from uh, my city of Petaluma to where, uh, he was. And so I, uh, kind of, I just had a shortcut for if, um, it, there was, there was a reason too. Cause like, um, there was a place in, and I'm, I'm struggling to remember how this whole, the, the whole concept of it was, but essentially either, um, I was going to some place if I was in, Oh, that's what it was. Okay. So let me re rewind here. I, uh, am terrible with directions don't do directions very well. And so I almost always use GPS to get to where I'm trying to go. And so I wanted to have a shortcut that would just um, look to see if I was in Petaluma. And if I was in Petaluma, then it knew that I was trying to go to the place where he was. And then if I, if I ran it and I wasn't in Petaluma, then it would GPS me to my home. So this shortcut um, would you know, go, okay, you're here. And then it would give me the directions to get to the place that I was trying to go. But I, what I wanted to talk about is something that's a lot of fun that uh, anybody can take advantage of. And it doesn't even require Toolbox Pro, but it's using base 64 encoding and decoding where you can actually take a sound and instead of doing a file, which might not show up on one device or it might have trouble syncing or something like that, this just goes ahead and, uh, turns it into a uh, base 64 encode, and then it can read it as plain text and turn it into a sound. So uh, there's an ongoing joke where, um, uh, Sebastian and I will, uh, quote Mario. And so there's like, it's a Mario time and different things like that. So I took, I think it's the sound of here we go. And I, cut that out on the internet and I encoded it as base 64. And then essentially what would happen is it would check if I was in Petaluma. Uh, and if I was in Petaluma, then it would give me the directions to where I needed to go. Or if I was out of it, it would give me the directions where I needed to go. And then after all that was done, it would play that sound. So if there's a sound that you want to have, um, and you're kind of worried about, uh, <laughs> you're kind of worried about the, uh, you know, it, it maybe trying to find the file that it's connected to, or if you're using an online link that could disappear. My tip for you is to use encode, uh, with base 64, um, which I've set up as a, as a separate shortcut altogether. So it asks me for a file. I give it that sound file. It encodes it as base 64, copies it to the clipboard. And then also I think just saves it as a plain text file so I can go back to it later. And then I'm able to take that text and copy it and then use it. And so then it will uh, play that sound from that uh, base 64 file. So let me actually delete um, 
all of this so that we can just play the sound. Let's see what happens whenever I hit this since we're connected. Here we go. Did you hear that? Excellent. Yep. That worked. So that, I guess, was here we go that I was doing. Uh, so yeah, that worked. Um, that was the, the, the end of the shortcut. And, you know, it's just fun. But I wanted to mention that because I think that it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a good way to get what you're after um, without having to rely on having, you know, an internet connection to the file, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. This actually, uh, I, I've just swapped uh, in the show notes, so sorry for all the fabulous people doing the work behind the scenes. I've just swapped the next two items. This brings me to another great app, um, which you can use with shortcuts to store exactly things like that. Um, because, for example, say you want to use that file, but you might want to use it in three or four shortcuts. Now, there's a couple of ways you could do that. You could have one shortcut, which is, you know, the, the base 64 encoded with the play sound, and you include that with the run shortcut action in multiple shortcuts. But maybe you want a menu of different sounds and you, you saw the text box there on my screen. It's pretty huge. It's taking up a lot of space, at least visually. So it's not so easy to scroll through. And Ma Micah didn't know what that was called anymore, what that sound was. Um, and this is problematic at times. Mm -hmm. And so for this, I like to use a great app called DataJar. And DataJar is basically jars of data for you. Um, so people who are more familiar with programming or just, you know, familiar with this sort of technical terminology, this is a database. Um, and for people very familiar, it's a NoSQL type database where you can have whatever you want in there. Okay. And you don't have to create a specific structure. But what I could do here is I can tap add value. Um, and then I could say, I don't know, call this one sounds. Okay. And I'm going to make a dictionary of sounds. So I can have lots of different sounds. Um, and then inside of sounds, I could add, it's Mario time. <laughs> okay. Or it's time to go or whatever. And then I could paste that base 64 encoded value in here and tap save. And then back inside of shortcuts, uh, if I create a new shortcut, and you can see I've been doing a lot of messing around to prepare for this show. So I've got I'm up to 33 uh, untitled shortcuts right now. Go me. Um, but if I pop into the app section, this is another way you can find out um, what actions an app has and go into data jar, then you can see get value. Okay. And it's talking about this key path. Well, what is a key path? Basically, that is how I get this. So if I tap and hold on this, I can copy the key path. Um, and so I then paste this in and that's it. Okay. So it sounds dot... It's Mario time. Okay, so don't put a dot uh, in the name. It shouldn't allow you to do that in data jar. Um, but then whenever I run this, I'll get this value. So I'm just going to go ahead. I'm going to tap on this and I'm going to say hello. Um, okay, because I, I, I can't base 64 encode things in my head, but that's okay. <laughs> if so you could, I'm just I gonna, would. Oof. I know, but I run it and it gives me back hello. And now this value is available in all of my shortcuts. Um and so I can get this anywhere I want. And this means that I could potentially have the same data that's accessed by multiple different shortcuts. Or if you are like me and you think, hey, you know what would be cool? Writing my own sat-nav system inside of shortcuts. Well, you could create something called driving directions. Oh, my word. Um, and I have a whole bunch of information in here. Okay. And I'm going to pick uh, this one, the mal, because it's it's not anywhere actually important. It's a public place. Okay. And so I've got a whole bunch of things. So I've got active, so I can set this to true or false. So if it's temporarily closed, like things were quite a bit last year, um, then I could disable these. So they didn't show up as options for me to pick. Um, and then I've got the, the address, which is just text. Um, and then I've got a little icon. Okay, um, and so if I pop back into here, I'm going to delete this untitled shortcut because otherwise I'm going to have even more to delete later. Um, you can see I've got a whole bunch of shortcuts here for driving, okay? Um, but I've got this particular one, which is driving destination, and I will just open this up. Um, and it is, just double checking, this one here. Um, this iPad is a little confused because I reset it a couple of days ago. All right. So uh, it's this, what it does to start with, it goes through my calendar and it ignores some calendars and it creates menu items um, for me. Um, and so it's actually using Toolbox Pro to create a menu with an icon and my my item from data jar. So it gets all this. Oh, um, I forgot to restore my premium access inside of Toolbox Pro. This is what happens 
when you uh, reset your iPad. Oop, I will just click restore purchase there. There we go. Uh, much better. So now, this time, <laughs> when I run my driving destinations, um, there we go. Then it should pop up with a fancy looking menu with a whole bunch of different icons next to each uh, option. Uh, this is running really slowly because it's got a couple of hundred calendar uh, events to process as well. Holy I moly. needed to, yeah, I need to slim that down because it goes through my calendar. It looks for anything uh, with an address in it um, uh, as well. And then it comes up with all these places and people. I'm just going to tap away from that because there's a bunch of addresses in there as well. Um, but it gives me all of this information so that I can choose from people. Um, and it's using data jar as well as toolbox pro to create a sign up for me now obviously this is perhaps something a little more complicated than what you want but i also had something uh another shortcut which would help me parse um calendar events to remind me to check in for flights on an airline okay so i've got dl which stands for delta lh lufthansa uh os which is austrian airlines ua united ib iberia ba um, British Airlines, and then there's a number. Okay, so if I can if I can check in 24 hours before flight, it says 24. If I can check in 23 hours before flight, it's 23, etc. And this helped me look up, and so I could then go through events in my calendar. I use uh, a service called TripIt to generate a calendar with all of my travel information for me, and I could go through and pull out the events which were flights, get the flight number, and then look up with this information here how far before the flight I could check in. And then I can just adjust the date of the flight by this many hours in the past. That's mm -hmm. why Austrians is 47, because you could check in one day in 23 hours, but calculating one day in 23 hours when sometimes you don't have days is more complicated. Um, so I just said 47 hours before, it goes back 47 hours and that adds uh, a due reminder to tell me to check in. And that information is here. And then whenever I end up traveling with a new airline, which I will probably end up doing as I now live in the UK again, um, I can just go ahead here, add another value, set it to number. Um, and then, you know, whatever that is, just add it. So if I end up flying with say Brian Air, um, then I can do that um, and just add that easily data jar a nice place to store all of your uh information for shortcuts it's as you said a database um available for free that's cool mm. uh and then of course has a tip jar so that you can uh, yeah. add more and then as you said the sync is all built in so then yeah and it, it stores everything offline as well um so if you're throwing lots of data in here obviously it's going to take a bit more space on your device um but it's designed to work offline so i can be sitting on a plane um at thirty thousand feet no internet access because i'm not paying 50 dollars an hour for for that um and all of this still works um which is brilliant and then when i get on the ground and i connect to the airport wi-fi it syncs up done it's brilliant Nice. All right. We're going to take a quick break before we come back with more awesome apps uh, because I want to tell you about Sennheiser, who are bringing you this episode of iOS today. Look, when it comes to earbuds, it's all about sound quality. And that's why you have got to check out Sennheiser. They make the best earbuds money can buy. For the past 75 years, while other companies focused on phones or tablets, Sennheiser has put sound first. And their new Momentum True Wireless 2s deliver the best listening experience and have been finely crafted for even the most discerning listener. With their free smart control app, you can adjust the sound to your personal preference with the built-in equalizer. You can switch off your surroundings and dive into that impactful song or important episode of your favorite podcast like iOS Today with their new active noise cancellation feature. Up to 28 hours of battery life, these earbuds can last you all day and then some. You can feel the quality of Sennheiser's earbuds the second you put them on. And they've also got over-ear headphones and soundbars for all your audio needs. That's why it's no wonder CNET called the Momentum True Wireless 2's clearly superior sound quality to the AirPods Pro and the earbuds to get if you value sound quality over everything else. I've got a pair here with me that uh, Sennheiser sent my way. It's got USB-C charging on the back, so you can plug that in and charge that 28-hour battery. Uh, it's a nice fabric case. I always like to make that sound. There's something nice about just kind of holding this. Um, and you'll see there are two uh, little earbuds in here, true wireless. And so each of them uh, independently pops into your ear. And what I love about these two is that Sennheiser 
um, who knows a thing or two about uh, about sound, these are designed in such a way that they are angled so that they fit into your ear canal in the proper way. A lot of uh, earbuds that you get are going to kind of just rest uh, rest just right within the hole of your ear or sometimes rest outside of your ear. These ones are angled to match kind of the standard way that uh, your ear canal is shaped so that they will slide in just as you need to. And in fact, they they tell you how to do it. You pop it in and then you kind of twist and then it goes where it needs to go. There's uh, several different ear tips and then each of them has um, a little sensor on the earbud so that it can be smart about turning on and off uh, the sound or, or pausing the sound should you uh, take one out. So that's also very nice. Uh, the They sound really great and they have uh, nice touch controls on them, which are completely customizable. So you can uh, set them up exactly how you want. And uh, they are also IPX4 rated. So you uh, can keep that uh, splash from uh, affecting these earbuds. So why settle for anything less than great sound? You have got to come hear the difference with Sennheiser. And this is pretty cool. Right now, for our first 100 listeners who go to Sennheiser.com slash podcast and use the promo code iOS, you're going to receive 15% off the Momentum True Wireless 2 earbuds, and this is great, or any of their amazing headphones. So if there's something else on that list that you'd like to uh, check out, well, you can do that too. Again, that's 15% off when you go to S-E-N-N-H-E-I-S-E-R.com slash podcast and use our promo code I-O-S. Our thanks to Sennheiser for sponsoring this week's episode of iOS Today and for making great sound in this tiny little package. We appreciate you, Sennheiser. All right, Rosemary Orchard, what is your next power-up for shortcuts? Well, my next power-up involves powering up your home as well as your shortcuts, and that is HomeBot for shortcuts. So for people who've previously experimented with the home actions inside of shortcuts, you might have noticed that things look, what's that word? Limited, <laughs> um, lacking in choices. So you can see I've got two homes here and I can either get the state of something or I can control something and that's it. Um, and, you know, if I want to control, say, five or six lights, then I have to scroll down and I have to find the light. Okay, so this is my kitchen light. Uh, and then I can say, turn it on. Okay, great. Now I want to control the hallway light as well, but I don't want a scene for that because I rarely use it. And mm -hmm. you've got a limited number of scenes actually in HomeKit that you might at some point, at least uh, if you're, you're a HomeKit nerd like me, run into. Well, there's a workaround for this and that's using HomeBot. Um, and of course it's hiding from me. There it is. So again, it's only got two actions, but you'll see, get home items and run home action. This is a little bit more powerful. So you can choose to get a whole bunch of information. As you can see right here, um, you know, I, I tap on this and bam, there's so much. Okay, so I can say item type. Uh, let's let's go with devices. Okay, uh, item service types, light bulbs. Uh, great. Um, well, uh, let, let's skip that for now and run this. Um, and let's see, it's got access to my home data. Um, and then I've got 26 lights, uh, Micah. That's quite a few lights right here. Um, so now I've got all of my lights. Um, well, I could actually do something with that. I can run a home action. Um, oh, I added that one twice. That's an accident. There we go. So um, I can see, you can see it's added automatically the home items from before. Um, so, and I, if I tap on it, then I, I could choose something, but I'm actually just going to tap away and leave it alone. Instead, I'm going to switch the device status. Okay, now this is a little bit tricky because it's going to mess with a lot of lights in my office, but we're <laughs> going to do it anyway because I've turned on a light that is not HomeKit controlled for this. So if I run this, then it is going to flip the status of 26 lights in my house. And it couldn't do it because one of my British accessories is unavailable. Of course, it's probably my Hue Hub because I have an internet outage earlier today. Um, but ideally what it would do is it would then flip the status of all of those lights. Okay, so every single light that's turned on would get turned off and every single light that's turned off would turn on. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, you can do more than that. You can, you can say, uh, trigger particular scenes um, or you can, you know, do a whole bunch of different things. Um, and one thing you should do is tap on the little uh, 
bubble in the top left of this of these actions and then show info. Um, and here it doesn't explain it too much because there's too much to talk about inside of this. Um, but if you open Homebot itself, there's examples. So you can say that you want to set the brightness of all the light bulbs in a room, or you want to change light bulb colors, or you want to switch your primary home kit home. This could be useful for those people who perhaps you know travel between their house and say their, their parents' house or family member's house um, and, and stay for a while there. Swapping your primary home um, as you go backwards and forwards could be really useful. Um, and it's much easier to do things like set your thermostat's temperature and stuff because you can just if you do this uh, and we open this one up, uh, I do have a thermostat, but you can use measurements um, to actually convert it from Celsius to Fahrenheit and do all sorts of fancy things. And then it will come back and it will say, hey, the, the, tar the target temperature is actually set to this. Um, and then at the end of this, what I would do personally um, is uh, we just need to give this shortcut access to HomeBot. Um, I would put in a show result action. Um, and just for people who aren't familiar with show result, show result is a great way to give yourself information back from a shortcut. But um, this allows you to use it when running uh, a shortcut through, for example, um, the, the play button inside of shortcuts or from your home screen or through Siri. Mm -hmm. So if you run it on, say, a, a HomePod or something, um, then uh, it should actually hand it off to your iPhone in this case because it's got HomeBot in it. Um, but then what it should do is it it will actually speak back to you. Okay, so if you talk to, say, your AirPods, then it'll speak. But if you're running it, you know, with your fingers, then it'll show it to you. And a lot of actions and shortcuts are designed to do that. But show results is one of those that's really powerful for this. Um, what I love about this is the powerful filtering that you can do that you're not going to find anywhere else. So for yeah. folks who are uh, listening instead of watching, uh, you didn't quite get an opportunity to see the different uh, filtering things that are available in kind of the main menu for um, HomeBot whenever you're using it within uh, a shortcut. But it has it's basically using the terminology that Apple has set for HomeKit, uh, the framework of, of HomeKit, so that you can drill down to get specific devices across your whole HomeKit setup. So it's a very powerful way to quickly choose amongst the different devices and use their, their current status that they're reporting or the current uh, type of device that they are they're really in-depth filtering that you with, with it, it's kind of like let they, they went in and they found everything that HomeKit lets you kind of uh, define or name and made that all available to be used as a filter in order to perfectly select the items that you're after and the ones that you want to control so this yeah it's absolutely a power user app but i think that uh, when you start to think about what you can do with it, um, it quickly becomes an app for anybody who has a home kit set up in their in their home. Yeah, yeah. And at one ninety nine, it's it's a it's an incredibly cheap app. And I mean, personally, I like the fact that I I can just say get all my lights, turn all, all my lights off, done. Um, and then I I've I've set this up as a shortcut that I run fairly frequently. Like for example, when I connect to CarPlay, I don't need my lights on anymore, so it just turns all my lights off done um and you know and i can do that because of automations um but that is something we can we can get to later uh for the time being micah what do you think about connecting to apis with shortcuts is this something you've ever played with or is this something you might aspire to one day do but you're you're a little bit daunted by this right now yeah so apis can get a little scary and the other thing that i have an issue with with apis is I like to do as much as I possibly can in terms of automation on my local network because uh, time and time again, I am disappointed by the uh, latency and the reliability of using the internet to run uh, different smart home automations for me um, yeah. or different types of automations in general. So IFTTT, um, 
it works for the most part, but when it doesn't, it's very annoying. And so then I just end up not using any of the stuff that I would, uh, that I've set up with it, you know, before when it comes to specifically smart home stuff, if it's say, you know, like a, a Google doc that I've IFTTT or something, all of that's online anyway. So that yeah. tends to work very well. Um, so because of that, I also don't often recommend uh, API stuff because I, you know, if I struggle with it, I don't want other folks to have to struggle with it too if it doesn't work. But all that said, you have so many different automations set up across all different kinds of things, both online and offline, in the cloud, local network, and you seem to make it work. So yeah. it's, it's awesome and I'm glad that it works for you. Can you tell us about uh, what, what you're doing? Yeah. So one of the things that I've got, so actually, if you look uh, here in my shortcuts app, if you're, if you're watching the show, then I've got a whole bunch of actions related to iOS today. Um, and uh, you can see I've been, I've been playing with a few things, but one of these uh, magic ones that I've got is fix apps missing data. So the first thing you'll see, I am using data jar for this. Um, and it goes ahead and it gets my credentials Airtable. So that's my API token for Airtable. So I don't have to worry about my Airtable being in here, uh, uh, my Airtable token being in here. And then it goes ahead and it grabs a whole bunch of data because I store um, a lot of this information um, inside um, of Airtable when I'm prepping for a show, because this way I can just go, yeah, I want to talk about Toolbox Pro today. I want to talk about HomeBot for shortcuts. I want to talk about Jade's Jar. And I just put them in and then later I can run this and it'll just do the information. I copy and paste it. And Micah thinks that I'm amazing because I've done all of this <laughs> homework. And the secret is people, shortcuts did it for me. Um, but that's okay. But the thing is, is in order to set this up, I had to get some data back from Airtable and check how it was formatted. And that is where things can get a little bit hairy because especially when you're trying to remember how to do things, it's a little tricky. Um, and so from the creator of DataJar, we also have a great app called JSON. And JSON is spelled in this case, J-A-Y-S-O-N. Okay, JSON, the format is J-S-O-N. It stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Um, and basically it's a way to have keys and values, just like in a dictionary. Okay, so you would have aardvark and then the description of an aardvark there. Um, the, the beauty of JSON is it allows you to go ahead and view things. So I've got some information from D&D uh, &D here. Um, so it's got a whole bunch of monster information for me. So I can go through and go, okay, so one of the keys here is, um, let, let's look for something I can pronounce, a blink dog. There we go. Um, so I've got a blink dog and XP. Brilliant. Okay. So, oops, I, I tapped the wrong button there. Um, I'll just scroll back down to my blink dog. There we go. Um, so what I can do is if I tap and hold on the XP, then I can actually copy the key because JSON is used inside of shortcuts a lot as dictionaries. Um, so if you've ever played with the dictionary action inside of shortcuts, um, then you will have found that there is the option to get value from dictionary. Um, and the reason why I talked about JTJAR before is because JTJAR is also basically a dictionary. Um, but if we put get value from dictionary in here, now I don't have a dictionary right now, but that's beside the point. You can say get the value for key. And if I paste this in, um, then it's XP. But if I put bowling count first and then put dot, huh, this looks like data jar notation. It's actually the standard notation that JavaScript uses, JavaScript, the programming language. Um, and it's also what shortcuts uses to navigate between multiple different levels inside of a dictionary. Oh. And JSON is a really great way of letting you view all of this information from an API call that you've made, and you can even split screen it. So if I make an API call and I'm I'm setting up a shortcut, I'm trying to program it, then what one of the things I will do is I will throw this view JSON action in there and I tap save and, and I, I use show more and I save it uh, either locally or in iCloud. And then it will split screen that information it gets back. Mm -hmm. And this makes doing, you know, working with APIs a whole bunch easier. You're still going to have to get set up with authentication and so on. Um, but depending on what API you're interacting with, that might be much easier than you think. So for oh. example, I have a NetAtmo weather station here at home. Yeah. Now, fortunately, this has got HomeKit integration, but the previous version of NetAtmo that I had when I lived in Austria was a version one. It didn't have HomeKit integration, but throwing away a perfectly good weather station just because it didn't have HomeKit integration kind of 
ate at me. Like, yeah, you don't really want to be doing that. Like, why would I do that? So what did I do? Well, I used the API and I had to play around quite a bit to get this information back. And JSON was the app that helped me do that because I could get this information back and show it. And it does just navigate through and you can do this. And so then I can tap and hold, copy the key, copy the value. I can even edit um, this and add more data to it. I can split screen it so I can see lots of different information at the same time and close different tabs, all sorts of things. Um, but this is just an incredibly useful application when you have JSON files on your iPad or your iPhone that you want to uh, edit or look at, or if you're interacting with APIs and you need to know what is this data coming back and how does it work. Ah. Um, and then you can take this information and then you can put it back into shortcuts however you need it so that you actually are ready to go. That is an incredible tip uh, because, yes, I have struggled. Um, you know, th there's sometimes where APIs are available and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I definitely want to make use of that. I think that'd be fun. And then I don't know how to get to what I'm looking for uh, specifically. So this idea of using JSON to actually uh, kind of... Uh, translate and understand the API and what it's spitting out and how it's spitting it out. That's super helpful. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing uh, that tip with us. All right. Well, there, there's another one that I want to talk about because uh, I know, Micah, you're a big fan of Widget Smith, uh, the, the app uh, created by David Smith. Um, and it's a great application for getting different information onto your home screen. But sometimes I want to get information from lots of different places and stick it together. And Widget Smith's great, but it's not quite as customizable as I would like. And I did some digging around a long time ago and I came across this great app called Widget Pack. Now, Widget Pack, if you're looking at it here, you're going, huh, I see something called a shortcuts grid if you're if you're looking on the screen. That's one of the widgets that you can create with Widget Pack. Um, and the there's a whole bunch of examples in here. So you could do uh, a really aesthetic uh, uh, date um, widget. You could have a Christmas countdown in there. You could get the astronomy picture of the day, which uh, Micah uses an API um, to, <laughs> to get this information. You can also do a home screen contact. Um, and I'll, I'll import this one because uh, it'll let me. So you, you choose a contact, it'll resize their contact picture, um, and then um, it'll clip it to a circle, superimpose it on a custom color, um, and then um, it, it puts it on your home screen. But I have a couple of other widgets that I create. Um, so say, for example, I've got a podcasting widget, um, and this one gets a whole bunch of information out of my calendar. Um, there we go. And um, it formats it and so on. I'm not going to go through all of the details of how precisely this works. It's a little uh, complicated to explain here, but if you go through the examples, mm -hmm. then you'll find um, that it's it's pretty simple. And now if I pop over into the widgets, this is a widget that I created ah. that shows me my podcasting schedule. So today, um, you know, an hour and 15 minutes ago, uh, we I had iOS today um, and that's still running. So therefore, it's still on there. Uh, and uh, next week I'm recording automators and then on next Friday I'm recording iOS today again. Look at that. Um, and so, I, it, you know, it's, it's great because this I can neat. do all kinds of things with this. Um, and I could look, it looks a little janky on, in the small one. In large, well, it's just smack bang in the middle. I usually have this. Um, as my medium widget. Um, and we, medium is usually my preferred size for things like this, because this way you can fit quite a bit of information on there, but it doesn't take up like your entire iPhone home screen because I have three of these widgets stacked actually. Um, so if I, if I pop back in here and go back to my shortcuts, you'll see that all of these are in a folder. Um, and so I've got my uh, I've got my daily plan. I've got my tomorrow plan. I've got my podcasting widget. I've got an Instapaper account widget, uh, which I should swap out for Pocket because I recently switched back. And I've got a deadlines widget. And if I ran all of these, um, then it would put them, uh, you know, in, it, it will pop them in. But what I can also do, and I'm just going to show people really quickly how you can do this. If you use the get shortcuts action, um, then what you can do is you can get your shortcuts and you can get them from a specific folder. Uh, oops, there we go. So I can get my widgets folder 
And then if I repeat with each, okay, so I go through every single one of the shortcuts in my widgets folder and I use the run shortcut action and I put that inside this repeat when it unfreezes uh, because this iPad mini is apparently having a little uh, break. When I can tap and hold on shortcut here and then I can use my repeat item and then if I run this, it will go through and it will run every single one of my widget shortcuts. Okay, and this creates all of my shortcuts for widget pack. And then um, this will update and I have this run several times a day. It's connected to um, my various automations on my iPhone. Um, and theoretically, I might have to force restart widget pack because it's a little confused. There we go. So now I have a whole bunch of different things in here um, that um, you know are my widgets ready to go. Um, so then they, they appear on my home screen and they update. Um, and this this is actually how I update all of my widgets on a regular basis. They're built into um, uh, automations on my iPhone primarily. Uh, I don't tend to use widgets on my iPad a whole lot because until iOS 15, you can only have them in the left sidebar on the home screen. And that's just a real shame. Agreed. Agreed. Um, all right. And then we had one honorable mention uh, we talked a little bit about uh, before the show and this is uh, really getting into the nerdy uh, stuff, but I wanted to mention it because I, I think that it's a, a pretty cool app if you really know what you're doing or if you are kind of wanting to try things that uh, do get pretty nerdy, but at the same time, very power user-esque. So I was hoping you could tell the listeners and viewers about Shortcutify. So Shortcutify is um, a uh, shortcuts app which requires API access in order to do a whole bunch of things. Um, so you can access Airtable, one of my favorite um, applications for doing anything database like on the internet. Um, it can also talk to Spotify um, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and so I will just pop over and show this one. Oops. And I managed to press a button on my Mac, so I can't actually see anybody anymore. There we go. Um, so here in Shortcutify, um, it's not set up on, on this iPad because if it were, then you would be able to see all of this information when I tap into it. Um, but you could set up, say, Spotify. Okay, so you're going to need to set up um, everything with Spotify. Um, and if you tap on uh, connect account, then it, it will go ahead and try to connect you and you can uh, get, get all the information. There's setup instructions down here to help you actually get everything set up. Um, so it'll tell you, you know, you need to go to the Spotify's developer dashboard, create an application and so on. And once you've done that, though, then you will get the ability to, for example, play things on Spotify, um, set a playback device. Um, you can set your repeat mode. Um, you can play a specific Spotify URL. Um, you can transfer playback from one device to another. Um, you can get which track is currently playing, toggle shuffle, and so on. If you have a Coinbase account, well, you can also get the your accounts from Coinbase um, so that you, you've got that information in a shortcut. You could connect to Google Drive. Um, and then once you're inside of Google Drive, you can get files, you can get uh, a list of files, you can upload and download files, basically all the things you need to do that works around Google Drive not having Oh yeah, shortcut support. Um, there's there's also there's some Mac options um, which you can set up on your Mac, um, and you need to enable the uh, talking to a Mac via SSH to do this. Um, which um, if you're on your local network should be fine to do. But then you can do things like capture a screenshot or capture a video, wake your Mac. Um, a trigger keyboard shortcuts, lock your screen, put your Mac to sleep and so on. I actually do have this set up on my phone so I can sleep my Mac at night. Um, uh, I have a couple of shortcuts that I run before bed and one of the actions they include is sleeping my Mac. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of things that you can do here. So say for example, you're looking for a Spotify action and you, you just can't find it. Um, then um, you can um, you know, have a look here and get this set up and you're ready to go. Yes. Yes, I so I think that that app is very cool, um, especially the the Mac OS option. Uh, the ability to connect to a Mac is is pretty neat. But uh, again, that's where you kind of get in depth. I I like that it 
makes Spotify a lot like Apple Music uh, in terms of all the things that you can do with it. Uh, that kind of makes it more powerful. And then some of the other ones that maybe you wouldn't have as much access if you uh, used their direct integrations um, or you wanted to kind of go all out with shortcuts. Uh, that's where Shortcutify can come into play. All righty, let us uh, move on next to the news. Yes, folks, it is time for the news here on iOS Today. Up first, hey, there's an update out for iOS, uh, for, for um, your Apple Watch uh, unlock feature uh, by way of iOS 14.7.1. Uh, so this is a bug fix for your iOS device, probably an iPhone, uh, that will fix the, the some, some people are having a bug with um Unlock. So it says when you have unlock with iPhone turned on, unlocking your iPhone unlocks your Apple Watch as long as you're wearing it. But an issue in iOS 14.7 affects the ability of iPhone models with Touch ID to unlock the Apple Watch. This fixes an issue uh, where iPhone models with Touch ID cannot unlock a paired Apple Watch using the unlock with iPhone feature. This update also so provides... Oh, good, good. Yeah, so Apple said that this was for Touch ID, but I know at least one person with an iPhone 12 Pro who also had this issue that was fixed with uh, this this update. So if, if you've had it and you, if you've got this issue and your watch isn't unlocking, even if you're, you've not got Touch ID, install the update, it will fix it for you. Nice. So there you go. If you've been struggling to get that to work, uh, this is the fix for you. And of course, it comes with some very important security updates as well. So uh, get that update, get it now. Because uh, you need it. Now, this next one I'm pretty pumped about. In fact, um, I heard about it yesterday and found the Amazon listing for it, and they weren't selling it yet. So I popped it into Camel, Camel, Camel uh, so that I could be notified as soon as it was available. It became available this morning. What is he talking about? He's talking about Anchor's new Power Wave uh, car mount. So this is a MagSafe uh, enabled uh, car mount, and I have been waiting for. Anchor or uh, or you know one of the other big companies to make one of these that I felt was uh, a good choice. So Anchor is out with this, um, and as you, as it says on the tin, it is a uh, MagSafe charger that you can put in your car. Um, and it, could you find that there's a place where it lists the price. I don't remember. Oh it's yeah. It's thirty five ninety nine. There you go. Thirty five ninety nine. There's my favorite. I love those. Ex for people who are listening, there's an expanded view of what's all built into the charger. Um, and so it shows you kind of the, the technology that is uh, running for this. So this is not just a magnetic charger for your iPhone. This is a MagSafe charger, meaning that it is using uh, the, you know, it, it's gotten the blessing, so to speak, from Apple uh, to be able to market it, market it as a MagSafe device. Uh, currently, when I go to the Amazon listing, which is now available, it uh, does not it says that it'll, it's, you know, it'll ship in like, uh, what does it say? It's, yeah, it's in stock soon. We'll ship About August 14th through the 21st. So, uh, pretty exciting. And I'm kind of shocked at the price. I thought for sure it would cost more, uh, given every single MagSafe device seems to be pretty expensive. So I was, uh, impressed. Yeah, yeah, this is this is great. I have a couple of the Anchor um, accessories. Uh, I'm just going to see if I can unplug this one on my desk. There we go. Uh, so I have uh, this one, which is a, a charger. So so this bit's, you know, the MagSafe puck. And then there's a, another Qi charger down here that I can use uh, with my, my AirPods or AirPods Pro. Um, and I have to say, I really love their stuff. I've been playing with one of their uh, standard, um, just the Mag safe type puck uh, at the sofa, and that works really well. I'm really pleased with it. Um, it's a lot cheaper than than Apple's. It charges a little slower, um, but uh, if you if you've got a mini, then you won't really notice difference because the mini can't charge at full speed anyway with the Mag Safe. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. Up next, uh, this is this is a little bit of a bummer, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Apple addresses this as quickly as it possibly can because we've talked a lot about the health benefits of the well, the health benefits related to having a uh, wearable that is tracking your different you know uh, health 
<laughs> measurements. And the Apple Watch is one that is very popular and it's been shown many times to have saved folks' lives and uh, will you know, measure heart rate and is used in uh, different health studies for uh, tracking COVID-19 symptoms and, of course, uh, heart uh, related uh, information. And there are some researchers who have s talked about how there is a bit of an issue. Um, the Verge has uh, had a piece that says Apple Watch's data, quote, black box poses research problems. So what they're talking about here is the fact that the algorithms used to do heart rate analysis and um, the the time between heartbeats and the that's HRV and the uh, the the ECG all of the stuff that it's taking measures of regularly um, those algorithms can change out of the blue and so when researchers are trying to kind of set up studies or set up uh, understanding of it and they don't have that constant there then it becomes more difficult to kind of get the research, uh, the, the data that they need out of these, these studies. So there is a conversation about, you know, what can be done so that folks can have a better understanding of uh, one's health and one's, um, you know, one's ongoing uh, health what am I trying to say? One's ongoing um, health information. So yeah, this is this is a bit of an issue for sure, and it's something that I I have a feeling, as I said, Apple will address, given the fact that um, it's a major selling point that the Apple Watch can help people, and that uh, Apple seems to be continues to be all in on having this as a personal health device. Uh, so hopefully we continue to see some, um, or we start to see some improvements here specifically and with yeah. the researchers and Apple kind of working more in tandem to make sure that these studies can be done accurately. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. This next one, can you tell us about this? Because um, I was a little shook, <laughs> um, <laughs> particularly because I've purchased batteries before that had the little, um, there's like a, usually a little baby on there or a little child. With their tongue stuck with out the, or yeah, something. They're, yeah, they're making some kind of face. That's so that people don't accidentally eat these batteries uh, because yeah. they have the really bitter coating on them to make it so that you also don't Also works on it. pets. Yes, exactly. Um, so, um, you know, so so you can buy batteries. It's usually the coin type batteries, you know, the round flat ones that you would get in, say, AirTags um, with this kind of coating on. And it's, you know, if anybody's ever had a problem biting their nails, it's, it's the same stuff that you would paint on your nails um, pretty much. Only, of course, it's battery safe. Um, Apple is explicitly saying, don't buy batteries with this kind of coating and expect them to work in your air tags. Um, so, um, you know, basically uh, check um, to see what it is. Uh, hopefully you still got the packaging. Uh, if you think, oh, I, yeah, I may have actually picked up the ones with the better coating, it might be worth just buying a new pack um, of um, the batteries. Leave them in the, the packaging until you need to uh, replace uh, the batteries in your air tags. Uh, but basically, uh, it can not, it can basically, the, the battery won't work in your air tag. Um, and, I assume this uh, has to do of, with it not making the proper contact where yeah, it needs yeah, to. Yeah, it's the alignment, um, base, it basically how it aligns, it, it won't um, with the coating on there. Uh, and I know specifically Apple already have been told in Australia that uh, the, the battery is too easy to access. Um, I have to say it took me a good five minutes to yeah, open I the AirTag the first time I wanted to do to open an AirTag. It I was struggled. hard to do. Yeah. Um, that said, um, also when I was a child, you know those child safe capsule medication, Micah? Mm -hmm. My dad would always give medication to me to open because he couldn't do it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, he'd get the Calpol down from the really high shelf. Calpol is uh, children's liquid paracetamol uh, over here in the UK. He'd get it down from the really high shelf because obviously I couldn't access it by myself that way. Uh, he'd give it to me. I would open the bottle and I'd give it back to him <laughs> and then he'd pour out the amount that I needed and he'd put it back away. Oh. Um, so maybe just keep your batteries on a really high shelf uh, and maybe keep them in like a little baggie or something. So if they do fall, you know, if the baggie falls down, then it, they're all contained. So you'd have to worry about children or pets eating them. And uh, please, people, don't eat batteries. It doesn't matter <laughs> if they taste bitter or not. It's not good for you. Oh, but the bit of coating, it adds such a great experience. That zing, I tell you. This ya. is the new Tide Pod thing. Please oh don't God. do it. No, yes. 
We are we. I am making jokes. Don't do that. All right. There were air quotes on that for all of our our audio listeners. Yeah, because it's uh, I that was yeah not 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 too good humor. Anyway, um, next you can tell me a little bit about this because uh, you have a better understanding of it. Yeah. Uh, we talked a little bit about this on Smart Tech Today yesterday. Um, iOS fifteen seems to be trying to uh, move. A lot of of the extensibility and integration uh, stuff <laughs> over to shortcuts and away from just a built into Siri. And so where before you could, by default, use Siri to, say, uh, book an Uber, they are... Uh, having that functionality be part of shortcuts where you can ride hail uh, as opposed to that being built into Siri. So um, it says th the, the article itself from Mac rumors, iOS 15 to limit Siri functionality with third party apps. Uh, and the reason why I wanted to kind of give that uh, preemptive introduction is because when uh, Matthew was first talking about it, I misunderstood and thought that he was saying Siri shortcuts was not even going to allow this. But what is happening is instead of it being built into Siri voice control, they're just uh, kind of making it uh, be in, in shortcuts instead of it being kind of a built-in Siri extensibility thing. Yeah. So basically what it is, is you will no longer have the thing where, um, you know, stuff just gets automatically added to Siri and you can't really see where it's come from. You can't rename it. So something's got a weird name. You won't have that Starbucks drink order that you ordered four times for that friend when you were visiting. Um, and it's always there as an option. And every so often Siri goes, did you mean the vanilla strawberry latte cappuccino frost with extra free, uh, foam or whatever it is um, coming up? Um, um, because you'd never mean that. Um, and basically what it means is sure, uh, apps will no longer be able to say, hey, Siri, just make this available to us. Instead, what they will do is, um, you know, be able to add shortcuts and suggest shortcuts to you from inside the app, which they can already do actually, which you can then customize to be much better. So I'm actually going to pop open shortcuts here and I'm going to show um, an example something that I can do in shortcuts that I couldn't do um, just through Siri. Um, so, so this is the shortcuts application. And one of the, the applications that they specifically called out or the types of applications were was um, task managers. So I've got OmniFocus here. I'm for people who are staring at the icon going, huh, I am actually on the OmniFocus 4 beta, but I'm, I'm running the last version that runs on iOS 14 on this iPad. Um, but I can add an item, okay? And so I can tap into each of these and say, ask each time. Um, and if I scroll down all the way to the end of my projects list, then I can choose to ask each time for my project as well. And this is something I couldn't do. So I can add a task with a custom title um, and I can choose which project this is going to get added to. That's something I can't do through Siri. It's just too complicated. But this way, Siri can give me an option. Now, in my case, actually choosing to ask which project, you can see I've got a pretty long list of projects here um, that I need to do. So maybe I wouldn't want to do that. But instead, I could tap and hold on the flags option, and then I can say, ask each time. So when I run this, it will ask me to fill in both the name of the project, uh, so I'll just pop in test, um, and then I can specify flagged or not. And I can do this through voice as well. Um, so I don't have to, you know, so I, I get all the benefits of what I had before. Um, it's just that, you know, app developers will have to donate good shortcuts uh, actions, um, which I think is a great thing because if anybody has ever had this experience, I know we had somebody write in a couple of weeks ago, I've forgotten their name, unfortunately. They were looking for a Spotify action mm -hmm. um, and they were looking for a Spotify action to, to play a playlist or something. Um, they couldn't find it. It wasn't there. And they found after Googling that you have to play um, the the playlist multiple times and then eventually Spotify will go, oh, hey, shortcuts, do you want this? This, I believe, will fix that problem where now Spotify will just have to straight up give shortcuts the actions and then you can create because otherwise you can't do it through Siri at all. Um, and so I'm really hoping that this actually improves the the experience for everybody because right now it's very confusing 
what is from shortcuts, what's from Siri, because originally it was Siri shortcuts and then it's shortcuts again. And it, it all got a little bit messy and muddy in the middle. Right. Um, so hopefully this is going to clear everything up there. And as I was telling uh, Matthew, I think that uh, th- this while on the face of it might seem a little concerning is actually really good because what this means is they can focus instead of, you know, one team focusing on Siri extensibility and one team focusing on shortcuts extensibility and one team focusing, it's all in one place. If they focus at all where shortcuts is the thing that reaches out and grabs onto these different apps and those apps reach in and grab onto iOS, then that's such a focused area uh, for the company to, you know, throw the resources at, which is going to make for better uh, extensibility and better uh, integrations there than you would have if sometimes Siri can do this and sometimes Siri can't do that, where then you have confusion going, can I say this? Which then again leads to people like me not ever wanting to use Siri to control anything because I don't know if it's going to work for me. And it's happened enough that it doesn't work for me that I go, I guess I'm not using Siri to do things. I guess I just have to you know, do it by hand. So this is, this was good news to hear, uh, honestly. Um, all right, let us uh, cover one last story here. Uh, and this is, uh, another accessories story really quick about spec. Uh, spec is well known for its cases for, uh, iPhone, iPad, etc. And they have some new cases out for air tags. Uh, there are, I think four, yeah, four different tags, including a, a carabiner, um, that will, you know, you can clip it on whatever you'd like to. Uh, there's also a really cool luggage tag um, that kind of hides the AirPod so it's not in the way, uh, but it looks like a luggage tag and has all of that in there. And then a really ugly uh, silicone loop um, <laughs> that... This looks like they just took the Apple leather loop and made it out of silicone yeah. so that you you stick your air tag in it and yeah, it's there. I really don't like it. I don't like how it's making the handle all squished. It's... it. Uh, anyway, that one bothers me. But then the final one I really quite like and it's a, a keychain option uh, where the... It, it's silicone as well. You slide the um, air tag into kind of a pocket and it shows... It's, it's open so you can see the white of the air tag. And then the other side has this really nice braided metal on it that serves as the ring for your keys. So I think that one is a pretty cool one. Uh, I imagine it's going to come in different colors. These are all available for around 50 bucks. At, I think that might even be at most 50 I th- bucks. I think it's the metal one is, is $50. That's the one right at the top. And then the other ones are sort of 15 to 30, there we depending. Go. So the one that kind of just is a flat plastic black tag with a bump in it for the air tag, that one I think is $30 uh, or $40. And that, yeah. Yeah. Um, so there are yeah, several. It's... You can get them on uh, Specs website right now. Yeah, the Presidio yeah. Carabina is yes, uh, forty nine yeah. ninety five. That one, you know, you can tell it's it looks pretty high quality uh, and super durable. So if you're looking for something that's really gonna uh, hold and has, as yeah. they say, a secure gate closure, uh, that yes. is what you're getting yeah. with that. Yeah. So the secure gate basically is what's going to stop that carabiner popping off. So I've, I've actually got an Spigen AirTag holder here um, and it came with this really nice chunky ring on it, but it doesn't have that secure gate. So you, anytime you press this, it's just going to open. Um, and if this were to say get pressed right here, then it can oops. fall off. No. Yeah. My AirTag falls off. Um, and so I actually have this one here um, and I put it, uh, I have a, a Tom Bim Paragon backpack and I've got, a, a, there's a pocket on the inside with a little loop in it, which is perfect oh, for excellent. putting things like this on. Um, I actually prefer to put the AirTag inside of the bag uh, because you're less likely to misplace it. Um, and if it were to come, you know, detached somehow, then it, you would still have your AirTag. Um, and most suitcases have got little pockets inside, or you could open up the lining and stick it in there as well if you wanted to. But if you want it, you know, loud and clear on the on your bag, then you can you can do that. Yes. All right, folks. Look at the clock. Look at the time. It's shortcuts corner. And so we play the shortcuts corner music. Folks, this is the part of the show where you write in with your shortcuts requests and Rosemary Orchard provides you with shortcuts answers. 
Um, ah, yeah, I was just going to say, I uh, have never heard of this person that is the first part of Shortcuts Corner. I don't know who they are. I don't know uh, why they think they can ask you for help, but uh, apparently they uh, think that they can just reach out personally. Well. Yeah, wow. just reach out personally and ask you for help. How embarrassing. Yeah. I know. But the good news, Micah, is you solved this person's problem. So this is <laughs> clearly another Micah. Um, and uh, yes, so Micah wrote into us to ask, uh, is there an action I can use to get Siri to ask me out loud for specific input? I want to say, hello, Apple lady, custom wash, and then have Siri ask me for a number that will be a variable for setting a timer with the number I give it from another Micah. Very definitely another Micah. Uh, so Micah, how did you solve this? <laughs> well, first I'll say for any neurodiverse listeners out there who may not uh, pick up on the sarcasm, that this was me. I sometimes will message Rosemary personally and say, I'm having trouble with this. And uh, she's kind enough to, to help me with this. So yeah, I wanted to, uh, because we can't use vibration sensors for the washer, I wanted to set up a, uh, a shortcut or a series of shortcuts that would allow me to keep track of the time um, for my washer. So essentially I would say, uh, hey, you know who, uh, I, oh, I would just say, Hey, you know who normal wash or Hey, you know who rinse or Hey, you know who, uh, heavy wash. And all of those times are, you know, they, they, they stay the same, uh, for whenever I'm doing a wash. And then all I would do is set a timer. And at the end of that timer, then I could go up and the washer would be done. So, um, what I wanted it to do was occasionally I would do a custom wash, meaning that I might choose the delicate cycle or I might choose another cycle and hit the little button that says pre-rinse or extended, um, extended spin or what have you. And so in that case, I need to give it a custom number. Uh, so what I needed to do was have Siri ask me out loud for a specific input uh, to provide me with help uh, to, to be able to say, 35 or 47 or whatever the time was. And then it would uh, put that time in as the uh, specific time. So turns out you can do this with just two actions. Um, there's, uh, I've set it up, I called it custom wash. So I say, hey, S-I-R-I, custom wash. And then is my iPhone still, there we go. Yeah. Uh, so all you do is you ask for, and then um, I chose the uh, number uh, in this case yeah. with how long? So this is uh, asking for a, a specific, you know, variable, and then you choose what you wanted to say. So in this case, I wanted Siri to say how long, and then I that simply did just uh, put in an action for start timer, and then it takes the provided input that I gave it. So that would have been the number, and then minutes. And so I say, hey S I R I custom wash, and then Siri says out loud to me how long, and then I say thirty seven. And then it starts a timer for that. Um, I, you know, didn't know that it was this simple. Again, just two actions. And in fact, when mm -hmm. I first created it, I had an extra action in here to create a variable uh, before it got to the timer step because I thought it needed that. But Shortcuts is smart enough to be able to take uh, a variable from a previous a yeah. thing and use that for that. So you helped me figure out that I didn't even need that extra step and yep. uh, that made it work. And then I've got, I can show you here my other ones. So I've got normal wash, quick wash, rinse, and heavy duty. And those are all set for those times that I've uh, chosen. So pretty yep. handy little thing for me. And I know uh, Rosemary's probably going, you know, that could all just be one shortcut. <laughs> I know. It doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be. Here's the thing. An extra shortcut isn't going to cost you anything more than maybe a couple of kilobytes of space on your iPad. At the end of the day, deep down, if you go right into it, these are text files. Um, and so it doesn't take up a lot of space at all. When you look at it, sure, you've got pretty icons and, and, and stuff, but an extra shortcut or an extra five shortcuts isn't going to take up any more space. And if creating five shortcuts for different wash types and then one for a custom wash type does what you need it to do, then why not just do it? Sweet validation. <laughs> uh, all right. Is is there another one from this Micah yeah. character? 
Yeah, yeah. This Micah character has been pestering me for shortcut support. And this is one <laughs> that you've not yet solved yourself. So I thought maybe you could read out your question for me. I will do that. Um, and then uh, I, we, can, we can solve it live on air. So I sometimes talk to a person who's in a different time, a, a much different time zone. Uh, my family lives in a different time zone, but it's a little bit easier to do the math. But uh, got a few friends who live in time zones that are far different from mine. So here is the question that he asked. Is it possible to create a shortcut that's triggered by different different names to display tif- different times based on time zones. So I could say, quote, hey, you know who, what time is it for Rosemary Orchard? And it would tell me. But then I could also say, hey, you know who, what time is it for Ty Sargent, which is my mom? And it would tell me. Configuration in the shortcut would involve putting in names and their respective time zones. Maybe it would have even a few steps. Step one, hey, S-I-R-I, time zone shortcut, which then triggers the shortcut. Uh, Step two, Siri responds with, for whom? Step three, I give a name from the list I've created. And step four, Siri responds with the time for that time zone and person. So I could, in theory, I had developed the concept and layout for how the shortcut needed to be set up, but actually doing it is where I had, or excuse me, where he, Micah, had to reach out to uh, Rosemary for help. Right. Well, this is actually, Micah, very easy to do. You're going to be pleased to hear because I'm going to make you build this one yourself. Okay. Um, but there, there's, there's two pieces of information that you need here. Number one is you need to know that there's a time zones action. Okay. Ooh. And this needs three variables. Okay. So you, the first one, you can just input your current date right now. The next one is your, your time zone. And the third one is the time zone of the other person. Okay, so in my case, I've set this up for a Micah Sargent, some some random person, I guess. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, and it's converting the current date from London to Cupertino. And I ran this just now and it came back and it said that it's July 30th, 2021 at 1231. Uh, of course, it's now 1232, but that's beside the point. So this is the actual time zone part. So that's actually the most difficult. And then the bit that you need to wrap this all in is a menu, uh, not an NU, but I can't type today. So that's beside the point. So you've got to, you've got to choose from menu and then you, you type in the prompt for whom, question mark. And then here I can type in the name of the person. Um, and then when I would go to run this, if I ran this via voice, it would read out the options to me for me to choose one. Um, and if I run this via, you know, tapping on my screen or something, then it asks me for whom. And then I've got this. And if you remember earlier in the show, I modified one of the uh, the Toolbox Pro examples um, to have show results at the end. That will give you everything that you need right there. So I think that will solve your your problem quite nicely. The only thing you'll need to do is you'll need to give your shortcut a name. So for example, time zone conversion. Um, and then you're done. Nice. All right. Well, I will get working on that. It uh, looks like there's um, a, a bug in iOS 15 that won't let me change the uh, name of this uh, option in the menu. Oops. So I will have to set that up separately. But once I do, then I will be able to uh, convert. And so this currently has the date uh, there. Will it also tell me the time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So current date includes all of the date and time information. Perfect. So for, for people who, who don't really know how computers do date and time, you, you may remember the two, year 2000 bug. Um, and this was because um, basically we started counting computer time from January 1st, 1970 at midnight uh, UTC. Okay. So that's actually GMT London. Um, and um, that meant that when when we got that far, because we had only, we decided only use the last two numbers of the year, all of the computer programs had to be updated to account for the fact that, oh, wait, there's a, a new starting point. How do we know what to do? This is problematic. We have to rewrite everything. Um, but underneath it all, we're still counting from January 1st, 1970, um, midnight UTC. Um, and so time is always encoded and it counts in seconds. Okay. So every time you, you check that number, it's increasing. It's increasing second upon second. And underneath that, that's what shortcuts is using. That's what iOS is using. That's what macOS is using. That's what the internet is using. It's what banks are using. Everybody's using this pretty much. Um, and so if you if you dive down, then you've got that information. Now, what you could do, Micah, right at the end of your shortcut, 
is uh, underneath end menu, you could use a format date option. I'll just pop my iPad up here um, and search for format. Um, and then I should be able to find, look, Toolbox Pro has a fancy format date action. So let's pop that in. Um, I've managed to put this inside my menu option. That's not what I wanted to do. Um, and there we go. Now I'm going to format my menu result. Um, and oh, okay. So Toolbox Pro would be great if I wanted to know, for example, the day of the week. This is a bit more complicated to do um, with the format date action. Um, but if we scroll down, there we go. I can use the native shortcuts format date action for this. Perfect. Uh, and I'm formatting the menu result and I can change it and I can just say no date. I just want the time, say for example, medium. Um, and that will give me um, hours and minutes, 1236. So uh, format menu result and then uh, I choose yep. date Show format more. none yep. and, and time then format medium. Yeah, short or medium, probably. Uh, long uh, would be, um, you know, a very long one. There's also relative. Relative is really useful if you want to know, for example, how far something is in the future or the past. Um, so, for example, uh, this is in zero seconds because it's in the past. Um, so um, that's, that's not going to be very helpful in this particular um, instance. Uh, but this is really useful if you want to know, for example, you know, how, how far away um, is this date from now? If somebody, for example, says, oh, yeah, that should be with you on August 17th. Um, then it's it's going to go, okay, that's in about two weeks, six days, whatever it is. Um, I, I don't know. There's three weeks and something, actually. No, two weeks and something. I can't count anymore, my car. I've lost <laughs> the ability to do maths inside my head. Um, clearly, I, it's a bit too late in the evening. But uh, before we finish with Shortcuts Corner, I do want to add um, just a quick one that came up in the chat room um, as we were t doing the top of the show. And um, this is from Kalecki, who asks, how can you pause music? So Kalecki has two automations inside of Shortcuts, one for when the Apple Watch starts uh, record, uh, uh, a workout, which plays music, but then, you know, you need to stop music when you finish the workout, right? That's what you want to do automatically. Well, that's actually surprisingly easy to do uh, inside of Shortcuts. You just need to know where it is. So if you pop into the media, then, then you can have a look um, at various options. And there's just action here for play music. But if you add it, then it's just going to play music. And that's not what we're after here. What we're after is the play action. Okay. And if we scroll down, then there is a play slash pause action. And this is what we want. We just want to use the pause music. Um, and then it will pause whatever is playing. Um, and it could pause it here or on HomePods, uh, HomePod minis, stereo pairs of HomePods, Apple TVs, any AirPlay device, basically. But I will leave that as pausing here. And so if I have music playing and run the shortcut, that's how I will pause it. And that's what you can throw in to an automation on your iPhone for ending um, a workout if you want to. Nice. All right. Uh, let's move on. There's one bit of feedback we want to talk about today. Uh, this comes in from James. James writes, in the Native Files app, some apps apparently can become the default app to open certain file types. For example, if I open up a PDF file in Files at the top of the screen, there is a button that says Open in Documents. If I tap it, it immediately opens excuse me, the, it immediately opens the PDF in the Documents by Read app, which is kind of convenient. I think I've seen this show up for some media files, giving me the one-click option to open a file in VLC. But what if we have multiple apps that can open a specific file type? How does iOS slash iPadOS pick which one becomes the default, and can we manually change this if we want it to use another one? I have a feeling I know how uh, we'll both be answering this. So uh, if you want to go ahead, because it's uh, it's kind of it's almost like a, you think it's doing a default app, but it's just whatever happens to be available. <laughs> yeah. So so basically, if you only have one application that could open PDFs, so for example, you've uninstalled Books um, and uh, you've you've only got um, documents by Readle in there, then it will it will default to that because that is the only option available. But where you've got, say, six different options, so you've got PDF pen, you've got books, uh, you've got documents, um, you, you've got, um, I don't know, the, the liquid text, that's the one where you can compress PDFs um, in the middle and, and, you know, write notes all over them. Um, how does it pick? Well, the answer is very simple. 
it's using what it thinks you want it to use. Um, so for people who remember Apple's come out with this new um, sort of default music provider where sometimes it'll pop up and go, hey, I'm trying to learn, um, you know, what music, what audio provider you want? What do you want? Do you want music, Spotify, blah, blah, blah. This always happens to me when I'm driving. Always. I have no idea. It seems to always figure out, hey, she's driving. Now is a good time to uh, to ask her this information. Um, it's not, Siri. It's never a good time to ask me that information. It's always <laughs> Apple Music for me. Um, but you can select it. And you can't do that with files. But what you can do is if you tap on the document and use open in. So you tap and hold and use open in. And you use open in, say, five or six times on PDFs. And then it will change to that. Um, now, I say five or six times. Sometimes it's five or six times. Sometimes it may be 50 or 60 times. It's it's a case of iOS trying to learn what you, it, you expect from it. And this deep down is actually part of um, the Siri and intense um, logic, I believe, um, where everything's trying to learn what you know what what you expect and give you that information at the right time so what those things that show up on your lock screen that say hey do you want to place your starbucks order um and stuff like that that deep down is all part of the same logic um information um and so if you want to change it you've just got to tap and hold open in tap and hold open in and rinse and repeat nice and that there you go is your answer james thank you for uh always being very uh involved with the show we appreciate it and we love your questions all righty folks up next our app caps it's time for app caps Folks, this is the part of the show where we wear caps atop our head to honor our app picks of the week or gadget picks of the week. Uh, These are the things or apps that we're using now that we're excited about that we want to share with all of you. And uh, maybe they're apps that, you know, they've been in the app store for a long time or maybe they're brand new. In any case, we think that you should check them out and we're very excited about them. So we wear hats to say just that. Uh, Rosemary, I want to give your voice a little bit of a rest as you have um, handled a lot of this show today. So I'm going to go first here to talk about my right. app cap so you can take a sip of water or whatever you need to do. Uh, the hat atop my head is sort of a Zorro kind of thing. It's a, a sheriffy cowboy hat. Yeah, we'll go with that. Uh, it's a big old black hat. And uh, I, I think I like it. I might have to wear this out of the studio today when I... Uh, leave. We'll see. Anyway, um, my app is, uh, it's new to me and I think, uh, relatively new to some folks. Uh, if you're looking for some way to keep track of different things you want to check out in terms of kind of digital media. So that includes apps, books, uh, video games or, uh, app games, movies and shows and, uh, music, then there's a great app called Sofa Downtime Organizer that you should check out. Uh, I downloaded Sofa the other day, and I think this is a really neat thing. So what I love about Sofa is that it is linked up with different databases in order to provide the information that you need. And so let's... Um, let's go... What will pop... You, your main page here is something called The Pile. Uh, activity and the shelf. So the pile is this place where if you have, you know, you're talking with somebody, uh, maybe I'm talking with Anthony Nielsen about um, some show that he's recently watched or a game that he's recently played. I'm like, oh, I, I got to check that out. The pile is a great way to just quickly drop that and then come back to it later so you can organize it where you want to. Um, the shelf is a place for like content that you uh, have across all sorts of, of different lists. So you can just quickly see everything that's there. And then activity is, um, it, they, it's a way to log how you've spent your downtime, meaning it's uh, a quick way to go, oh, this is the stuff that I've checked out before um, and, you know, that I've used. And so it even has information about uh, how many video games you've played, if you've got video games in here, how many movies you've watched, et cetera, et cetera. And you can sort of format it how you want to. So I'm going to hide stats again. And we'll pop back out. And then uh, you can create new folders uh, as you want to, but I've, I've just kept mine to the basics. So let's hop into movies and shows to watch. And I'm going to uh, hit the plus button and I will choose movies and TV. And then I'm going to add, uh, let's go with Ted Lasso. Uh, and then I hit the plus button 
and up pops in this area Ted Lasso. If I tap on Ted Lasso, you can see the, the show up here at the top. And then down here is information about it. There are two seasons of the show. Where did it air? Apple TV Plus when it first aired. And then a little bit of information about the show. Uh, if I hit the the three dots, the more button, I can delete it. I can put it on the shelf. I can uh, copy a deep link, which means that it will give me a link directly to this page within uh, Sofa, and I can move it. Then there's also a little sticky note button. So I could uh, give a note like, uh, season one was fantastic. Gotta watch season two soon. Save it. And then now there's a little sticky note that's, that uh, pops up there on the actual, uh, the the you know the dvd cover essentially and then i could log that to activity if it's something that i uh, have have watched i can also keep it in this list if i don't want it to be removed from uh the movies and shows to watch or completely removed from this list since it's the movies and shows to watch list also in apps to check out you'll see i, do I dropped this uh there's a little bit of a, a spoiler but i won't talk about what it is uh because it's going to be rosemary's app cap uh but if i tap on that not only does it have all of the information from the app store about it it's also got what platform it's on what developer it's on how much it costs the genre and then a link directly to it in the app store and a link to the developer website right there i can add a sticky note to that if i want to and then books to read. We keep talking about Snow Crash. We keep talking about the metaverse. And yet I have not uh, checked this out yet. So Snow Crash is on my list in books. And if I tap on that, uh, I get a summary of it and some uh, praise for it. And then I can pop it open. This has an Apple Books link uh, to get it there. Of course, I will be listening to it on Audible. And of course, then I mentioned that Audible uh, has been a sponsor of the Twit Network. Uh, but that's how I choose to consume books. And then games to play. Uh, so, Anthony, give me a game. <laughs> uh, Mass Effect. All right, Mass Effect. Just uh, recently beat the Legendary Edition, which is kind of the remaster. So which one would that be? Uh, the trilogy. Just add the trilogy. All but, right. Yeah. Hit that plus button, there you and go. then when I pop into that, um, I've got Mass Effect trilogy all here, and then the official website. And look, it even shows what platforms it's available on: PlayStation and Xbox 360. Uh, I imagine you can also play it on the yeah Xbone. Um, and then last but not least, things to listen to. Uh, so we'll add a bit of music and let's see i don't know what to put here so i guess i'll just choose a song i have already listened to uh which will be i don't know uh, why can't i think <laughs> of a right, song all right mikey you can you can have my uh, the song that got stuck in my head after i heard two bars of it the other day uh that's the riddle the by riddle. nick kirschler all right we'll search for the riddle and there it is, Nick Kershaw, and now yep, that's added. That's and let's see what happens in terms of formatting. Uh -oh, it looks like it's struggling a little bit there. There we go. Um, so it shows the riddle, it shows the artist, it shows the release date, and look at all those links. I can open it up in Apple Music, Pandora, Spotify, or Tidal. Uh, all of those are available to me, and uh, it's right there as well. So now I've got some great things to check out in each of these. They're stored here. As I said, I can create my own custom list or group as I want to. And uh, let me just pop into settings really quick so you can see. Uh, I went ahead and subscribed to Super Sofa, which gives you uh, a little bit more control and access than you would get normally. Uh, but then you can uh, manage the data that you have and uh, set themes. Of course, I chose a green theme. Um, and yeah, that's that's it. It's, a, I think, a very basic app in terms of um, what you can expect, but a pretty in-depth app in terms of uh, how much it will quickly pull in the information that you want uh, about the different, uh, app, the different stuff that you want to check out. And as you can see, the iPad app looks a little different from the iPhone app. Uh, so there's, you know, it definitely takes, makes use of that big screen uh, as you want to. And yeah, I guess I should also mention in things to listen to, you could also put in podcasts or audiobooks or what have you. Uh, so it's all there. And then yeah, you're talking to somebody, you quickly throw it in the pile, and then uh, 
the activity option or yeah the the activity option where you can see oh yeah I've I watched this or here are all of the the movies I watched this year really fun so that is uh that's sofa downtime organizer in the app store available for free with an in-app purchase to add uh, some of the extra functionality including um the uh, ability to uh, export all of that data. All right, let us move to Rosemary's app cap. Well, my app cap today is an app called Directive um, and it's directive for maintenance. Um, so this is an app by Little Finn and you might've spotted it in Micah's app cap if you're watching the video. Um, and that's actually partially because I was gonna pick Sofa as well and then Micah stole my app cap. <laughs> broke Micah, broke Micah. <laughs> Look at me with my, my very villainous hat on. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I think we both saw it at the same time and I don't mind if you get there first and put it in the document, it's yours. Um, um, either way, Directive has been on my list for a while and uh, it's it's had a bit of a UI update, which is really nice. Um, but it helps you remember and complete routine maintenance to safeguard the important things in your life. Um, and look at what, as I swipe there, it did a little animation with the cog, which I love. So it suggests some things automatically. For example, inspecting a fire extinguisher. I, I have uh, fire blankets rather than extinguishers. Um, but there we go. I have a smoke detector that I need to test. Uh, personal uh, eye exam. I should do that. Um, and I don't have a pet, so I'm going to skip the rabies shot for now. <laughs> um, so uh, I think I'm good here. So I, I need to set some last completed dates. Um, and how about if I go back and I put this one in because I lost it at the end of the month last month. And my eye exam, I did, uh, there we go, it was on the 3rd of May. Perfect. So now I swipe to continue. I enable notifications to set this up. And look, I have to test my smoke detectors again today, Micah, to, to make sure they work because you should be testing these things on a regular basis. People say replace the batteries in them um, every time the clocks change. So when they go forwards and backwards, and that is a good way of doing it, but you should still be testing things just because you put a new battery in there doesn't mean that the battery is necessarily good. Um, so you have to test it. Well, I tested it earlier today. I burnt some toast this morning, um, which was convenient <laughs> because I can tell you that my smoke detector does indeed detect smoke. So I'm going to mark this as completed. Um, and there we go, I can confirm that. Um, I could also postpone and I can add instructions here as well. And in this case, because it's one of the default ones they've suggested, um, they've got a link to WikiHow. Oh, with those um, wonderful, uh, those wonderful yeah. illustrations, WikiHow yes. illustrations. Yeah. Um, and there's nine months until my, my next eye exam, but I can go ahead and if I tap plus and I can add a, a new directive um, and there, there's some other ones in here that weren't the suggested ones. So for example, cleaning the oven. Um, and then if I go ahead and do this, then it suggests that you should repeat this every three months and it gives you options for things like the complete uh, the repeat behavior. And you can also track supplies if you have uh, Directive Pro, uh, which is $3.99 a year um, if, if you if you want to get that. You can track 10 items uh, in Directive for free without that. And it's aside from, you know, blocking things like the track supplies, it's not actually going to bug you about this. It doesn't have adverts or anything and it's just free. Um, but you can, you can add a website to this. You can add some details. So for example, um, if you uh, need to replace um, uh, your, the, the filters in your air vents, um, and they're, they're not the standard size or you don't know what size they are and you always get to the store and go, I don't know what size I need. This is confusing. You can t write it down in here and then you you save it. Um, and there we go. Apparently I need to clean my oven today. Uh, I should actually go ahead and edit that because I did that in the middle of last month. There we go. I did it on the 15th. Perfect. Um, so I think uh, I did not change the, the next due date. Oh, that's because I put the next due date in the past. That uh, was silly. I will put that in uh, on, there we go, the 15th of September, if it's every three months. And as you can see, these are all sorted chronologically. Um, and if I if I look on the, at the upcoming directives, um, then I can see that that one's a home task every month. This one is a home task every three months, personal task every three years. You can also do a completely uh, custom one. For example, text Micah. Uh, because he keeps sending me these shortcuts requests. Um, and then I can change the category of this as well. And I can even add a new category. Um, so I could add a specific category to look after my mica if I wanted to. Uh, if you have multiple pets, for example, and you want to attract all of the information about them, um, then you could have two different categories, one with the name of one pet and one with the name of the other pet. Um, and that that you know can help you keep on top of this. Um, so uh, yeah, there we go. That That's how I could... Uh, 
remember to text Micah. I just I just have a, a due alarm every day that says check Micah's okay. Um, it doesn't have <laughs> shortcuts. So that, that's how I do that. Um, but yeah, this is this is really great. Uh, I, I find it works really well. Um, you can also customize what time it notifies you at uh, in the day. Um, so for example, it defaults to 9 a.m. If like me, you have a day job um, and you're usually, I don't know, busy working at 9 a.m., you could change that um, to notify you at say 6 p.m. after you finished work and had a bit of time to relax or whatever it is. Uh, uh, but this is a, a fairly solid app that does everything you need. It's very simple. It comes with um, iPhone, iPad, and Mac OS app. Um, and it's all in the same purchase price as well. So you get this on all the platforms, uh, which is great. Um, and the idea is that you spend $3.99 a year on this, but then you don't pay for emergency maintenance because you're actually doing regular maintenance instead. Yeah, I love the the. So I downloaded this this morning uh, just so I could be aware of how it worked, and um, immediately it was like, well, I've got to have this because I love the uh, tracking supplies feature. So when I clean my dishwasher and when I clean my washing machine, I get the little tablets that you can put in that are you know uh, that have all the stuff inside to help clean the dishwasher or the washing machine. And so being able to track supplies with that, so when you check it off, it you know removes one of the supplies, and then it'll give you a notification saying, hey you're about out of supplies. You might want to order some new ones. That's super handy. And, uh, you know, here's a pro tip for everybody out there. You should be draining your hot water heater once a year. Um, and that is like one thing that I, I found across like so many different people where I've mentioned this, They're like, wait, you're supposed to do that? Yeah. So you're, I shouldn't say drain. It's called flushing your hot water heater. Uh, essentially sediment builds up in the, if, if, let me also be clear, if you've got a hot water tank, uh, as opposed to the new tankless type uh, styles, if you've got a hot water tank, sediment builds up in the bottom of the hot water heater over time. And the longer you go without uh, draining it to uh, flush it out, the more sediment builds up and the less hot water you'll actually have to make use of. So uh, if you have noticed, especially for your own hot water heater, that uh, you your hot water doesn't last as long as it has, might be because you've never done that uh, job of flushing it. And there are plenty of guides online, and then also you can hire someone to come in and do it. But um, I, uh, in my home back in Springfield, Missouri, uh, that I lived in, I, uh, flushed the hot water heater and it was clear that no one had ever done it before because there was so much sediment whenever the time came to, to clean it out. Uh, but that's one that can go into this directive list and is a very helpful reminder. Um, apparently once a year is the best way, uh, to take care of it. So yeah, this is a fantastic app. Uh, and I immediately was like, yep, gotta have this one. That's for sure. <laughs> well, oh. I'm, I'm glad to have enabled you there, Micah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. It is time to say goodbye. Uh, if you have questions, feedback, shortcuts, corner, et cetera, send those to iOS today at twit.tv. There's been an influx in uh, feedback requests and, and questions and things. We're so thankful, so grateful. We love to have you tune in and check out the show. Um, yep. And so, yeah, you can send that to iOS today at twit.tv. You can also tweet at us with the hashtag ask iOS today, or you can uh, send it to us in the discord is a great way to get in touch. Um, this show records live every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. And you can tune in to join us live by going to twit.tv slash live. Uh, the best way to get the show, we feel, is by subscribing to it, though, because by subscribing, you will get it as soon as it's available. Twit.tv slash iOS is where you go. How you get it is by clicking on subscribe to audio or subscribe to video and choosing your provider, uh, be it Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, et cetera. We've got links all for you to use. Uh, we recommend the video version of the show, uh, but we do try to make it available to folks who can only have the audio version or uh, who you know, may not be able to uh, consume the video version of the show as well. So we try to be mindful of that. Uh, something else I want to mention is Club Twit. I mentioned the Discord earlier where folks can send us questions. Discord is one of the perks of Club Twit. For seven bucks a month, you get access to the Club Twit Discord server where we've got lots of great folks hanging out, the hosts of many a show and other folks uh, that are part of Twit and then all of the cool Club Twit members. But you also get all of the shows ad free. So that's every Twitch show with no ads. You get access to the Twit Plus bonus feed that has extra content you won't find anywhere else. 
and all of that is available at twit.tv slash club twit. We'd love to see you there. We'd love to have you join us uh, to hang out and uh, be part of the fun, but also support us. We uh, appreciate it so much uh, knowing that you are out there and that you want to support the show directly. So thank you. Uh, Rosemary Orchard, if folks want to follow you online and check out all the great work you're doing, where do they go to do so? Uh, you can go to rosemaryorchard.com. There's links to podcasts, books, uh, Twitter, micro.blog, et cetera, where you can find me and, and follow me online. Uh, Micah, where can people find you? Well, you can find me at Micah Sargent on many a social network or head to chihuahua.coffee, C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links to the places I am most active online. Thank you for joining us today for iOS Today. We say goodbye until next time. Adios. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you are interested in checking out all things smart home and Internet of Things, then you should check out Smart Tech Today, the podcast I, Micah Sargent, do with my co-host Matthew Casanelli. It's all about the smart home and improving your automations. 